Wow. Well, I'm, I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Kim McLaren. It's my uh, great honor and privilege to be moderating this panel. I first want to say to Karen, she did, I've seen this film. I show it to my students all the time. Um, I show the full version. Uh, and Karen uh, and her partner did a did a back there somewhere. did there an extraordinary is. job in a very short amount of time, <laughs> trimming it trimming it down from its regular running time so that we would have time for this conversation. And I think, but I think you you still caught the essence of the film. It's extraordinary. So flawless, um, flawless. flawless. yeah, yeah. <laughs> just really quite an accomplishment. Imagine um, that there's 30 minutes of Jimmy that isn't here that is still to be enjoyed, and there's more and more and more. He's extraordinary. Yes. We're just conduits. Yeah, tonight is going to be hard for us not to just sit here and gush, so uh, we're going we're gonna to try. Um, it's going to be particularly hard for me. Um, I am not only honored but thrilled to be moderating this panel on the life and legacy of the great James Baldwin. James Baldwin is my hero. If you know me and you've talked to me for more than, or even if you've just met me for more than 10 minutes, uh, and we've had a conversation, you will know that, uh, that James Baldwin is my hero. Um, I have a poster of him in my office. I have a picture of him on my front door. He's the last thing I see before I go out of the door in the morning. Um, in my book, Divorce Dog, Callie always tells me to mention the book, name of my book. In my book, Divorce Dog, um, I end with an essay called How James Baldwin Saved My Life, and that is not hyperbole. Um, there are two people in the world I would fangirl for. One is James Baldwin, the other is Prince. <laughs> and if Prince was standing next to James Baldwin, I would knock over Prince to get to James Baldwin. <laughs> so my challenge here tonight will be to moderate this panel and not take it over. But we have such an extraordinary uh, group of people that I don't think that's going to be difficult. Um, so after I start here, I'm going to largely shut up. But I, I do want to take moderator's privilege and just start off with what I think is a really critical point. The, uh, the blurb announcing this wonderful event said that this panel would investigate James Baldwin's call for equality and its relevance today. And that's great, and I think we are definitely, obviously, going to talk about that. But I want to make sure that it's not the only thing we investigate. As the film so brilliantly so shows, too often James Baldwin gets reduced to this message of racial equality. And, and certainly race, obviously, and more critically, whiteness, and the pervasive way it infects the United States uh, and continues to do, um, is one of his primary topics of exploration. But what makes James Baldwin so great, as you have just seen, is that he was not solely, or even primarily, I would argue, concerned with race. He was concerned with humanity. With, with love, with what it means to be human in this world. And that would, that's what makes him profound. He is profound. And so we're going to talk about his call for racial equality and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, when we discuss this on Basic Black, the show that I did, I'm part of, honored to be part of, and Peniel is on WGBH, I tried to make the argument stumblingly, not very well, but I tried, that James Baldwin was the most important American voice of the 20th century. Um, Peniel's laughing. So I'm going to throw this out to him. Tell me why that might be true, Peniel. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I think I would include people like Du Bois and Fannie Lou Hamer in a, a pantheon of people. Yeah, okay. But no, I, I think it could be true. And I, I love what you're talking about vis-a-vis um, -vis humanism. Uh, uh, my favorite Baldwin book is No Name in the Street. And I have the copy. Um, that I got um, when I was in graduate school. And uh, I love the fire next time, but the reason why No Name in the Street, I think, is so powerful for me is that this is the book he's writing in between those assassinations initially. This comes out in 1971, and he talks about Malcolm X's assassination. Mm -hmm. He talks about Dr. King's assassination, working on the Malcolm X screenplay. But he also talks about um, Stokely Carmichael. He talks about uh, Huey P. Newton. He talks about Eldridge Cleaver. He talks about um, young black men and women, but he starts the second essay, which is um, entitled To Be Baptized, with these words. He says, all, all of the Western nations have been caught in a lie, the lie of their pretended humanism. This means that their history has no moral justification and that the West has no moral authority. Words. Those are pretty tough words. And the thing is, he gets reduced because of saying this to saying that this is his angriest book. Right. right? It's so he's mm -hmm. caught. Um, Bal I think one of the reasons why Baldwin could be uh, the most important voice of the 20th century is, is the fact that initially Baldwin is speaking in a language 
that white liberals and white progressives of the period understand. And as that language becomes much more mature and more critical, he stops getting the love and the attention of that group of people right, right. Who, were, who were saying that he should be in this pantheon of racial equality, right? right. But he, he continues to insist and persist in terms of that radical humanism. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe what you started off with is a good way to start off. What is your favorite James Baldwin? Why don't we go through and maybe you can talk about what is your favorite James Baldwin work and, and why. Um, maybe I'll start with, well, what, what, actually, can I start down here at the end with, with Rose? Um, and, and well, say, I have to say that The Fire Next Time is uh, my favorite, and I think part of that is because Jimmy was writing it while he was in our house. Mm. And Bill was writing The Confessions of Nat Turner, and Jimmy had, was actually still writing Another Country, I think. Right. But The Fire Next Time was in his belly. Mm. And whenever we ha had our evening conversations, and he and Bill had lunch and dinner together and talked about uh, what mattered most to them. And uh, the burn, baby, burn. Yeah. <laughs> Aisha. It's a little, I wasn't introduced to James Baldwin in college or, mm -hmm. or in elementary school or middle school. Um, so it's kind of hard to put it in that kind of way. Um, everything about him I loved and all of his books are my favorite, but the one that stands out for me that along with The Fire Next Time that had the most impression on me um, as a young person was The Devil Finds Work. Specifically because you know there was an article written called James Baldwin is the greatest film critic that ever lived. And he was able to take his incredible ability to analyze and dissect and deconstruct whiteness as a construct, whiteness as an idea, and something that was completely created and made up, and use Hollywood um, and film as a way to examine this construct of whiteness. It's a brilliant book. I recommend that people who are Baldwin fans, besides Giovanni's Room and uh, The Fire Next Time and Go Tell It on the Mountain, that you really read The Devil Finds Work because it is a, a treatise, in a way, um, that speaks to the consciousness of our nation as it is reflected in film. So for all you film buffs out there, for people who are, who are into film, he, he really is able to analyze um, whiteness um, and how it is played out on the, on the Hollywood screen. Great. No, I, I agree with that. That's, ex that's extraordinary. And I, I think, I hope we can talk about uh, Baldwin's deconstruction of whiteness, right? I, I noticed that um, Bill Styron said in there that Fire Next Time explained black people to white America. But what, for me, part of what's so brilliant about the fire next time is that it actually explains white aware America to white America, if you're paying attention, right? It's, it's, and that's the much more critical um, yes. part of it. So, yes. um, Nikki, you wrote this brilliant essay on James Baldwin's poetry. Mm -hmm. What, what? Well, I hate you? to be the um, poet, the sort of, uh, I, I just refuse to choose. Right. <laughs> and I knew somebody was going to do that. I, I gotta. I have to do that because it's impossible to choose. Uh, it's like choosing, you know, between children, which no one would do either. Um, but I, I want to say that I think sometimes. Well, I've, I've been raised on Baldwin, and I had. I wasn't raised on Baldwin through teachers. Mm. I, I was raised on having to go find him in the world and stuff my pockets and my mouth and my heart with him. And as a result of that, um, I was able to become uh, the poet that I wanted to be. And w so what I, what I really love and what I I'm really want to say from this stage has a lot to do with his words that aren't always in books. His words that 
especially with this film, Karen and Doug, what I love so much is because I didn't embrace him physically in his life and because I didn't get to have a glass of wine with him, I, I get to see him walking. Mm -hmm. I get to see his beautiful hands. I get, as a poet, this is my, this is where I live. I get to see his gorgeous eyes dance. I get to um, see the smoke curl out of his mouth, even though I'm against smoking. Um, all those things that, those are the things that I think about when I'm thinking about um, Baldwin. And th there's, a, there's so many quotes that are, I'm, I'm almost speechless after I see this film. Every time I see it, I really don't want to talk. Mm -hmm. I feel, I just, I'm, uh, there's water moving through me in a way that I, I shouldn't be talking. But because he's, uh, he makes me so alive, he brings the life into me in a way that when, when I watch a video or when I'm hearing him talk, I just have to be still because I'm, I want to do a lot right after that. And, mm -hmm. But I want to share this quote that I was thinking of. Well, it's not a quote, but it's something he said about, he said, America, I don't know where he said it. I, I, all of that, I'm not going to cite. I just know that I'm paraphrasing. He said, America wants, Mer America refuses to look at itself as a complicated place. There are two things that, that Americans consider virtuous, simplicity and sincerity. And I was thinking about that because we're, we're living in this time where Baldwin is so current. He's so present in my mind. Every time I, I can't even cut on the news without saying, Jimmy, look at this. Right. You know? And so here we are in a time where every time I hear somebody sincerely say, well, I held that young black girl down in the grass because I sincerely thought I was keeping the neighborhood safe. Right. And so the rest of the neighborhood joins in with the applause. I sincerely thought that black man who, was, who I was arresting was reaching for my taser. And so if it were not for the camera, we would believe the sincerity of that person we have hired to protect us. Mm -hmm. So I was watching that and I was thinking about the moment we are living in and how Baldwin is with us if we would but listen yes. to his words. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yes, excellent, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so much to unpack there, and I, I agree with you. I had, the, the film does have this profound impact, and for those of you who, and I'm gonna get to your favorite book, so you can have more, more time to think about it. Um, if, if, you, if this is the first time you've seen him, there's so much of, of Jimmy online, right, including that great debate where he wipes the floor with William F. Buckley, I will tell you. <laughs> It's brilliant. Okay, Rose. I'm, I'm sort of like Nikki in that it's very hard to choose. When I first encountered James Baldwin, it was a course in college, and I had just come back from a junior year abroad, and I read Notes of a Native Son, and I was thinking about whiteness, my own whiteness and my own identity, but I was thinking even more about my humanity, and every time I've read him since, and this is going now, we're into 40 years, um, I learn more about myself. I see it reflected in what's going on in society now. Each time he's incredibly relevant. And so rather than talking about how much each of his books mean something and continue to mean something new to me as I reread them, I would talk about the footage that we found to make this film, and not just as a writer, but you can hear it as a preacher, as a public speaker, as, as someone who we had to, first of all, we were working when, with him when he was alive to make a film. And that's a story that's worth telling, but I, I want to answer your question more importantly right now. Um, the film, when he died, we suddenly realized, well, what are we going to do? This is about a writer, and um, we might have some photographs of him hunched over a typewriter. We didn't know what was out there, and then we began to do research, and we found 
Baldwin, the, the recorded speaker, the person who said things at age 40 and then at age 60 that were consistent. And it was extraordinary. We didn't know if we could cut together someone at age 33 and 47 and 62 and finish sentences and still be saying the same thing, mm -hmm. despite the fact that he was so criticized during different periods of his life. The fact that he was that eloquent and that consistent, and I find that in his writing, but I find it in his entire being. Mm -hmm. That's what matters to me. Right. Yeah, even at, at 23, really. I mean, he was really a prodigy in a, in a way. Um, uh, it's extraordinary in the last interview um, with Quincy Troop. Uh, he talks about Miles Davis and himself and, and the, the commonality there of, of them being prodigies. But um, um, so, yeah, I, I want to continue with, with other people talking about, let's talk about the, what, what Nikki brought up about his relevance today. What do other people want to jump in? I mean, um, of course, one of his famous quotes is where he talks about, I, I would just read this, where, where he talks about Bobby Kennedy. Did he mention this in any of your talk? Uh, Bobby Kennedy saying, don't worry, in 30 years there'll be a a black president, right, a Negro president. And so people often think, what would he think about Obama? What would he think about where we are today? Would anybody want to jump in on that? I just jump yeah. in, last quote, in terms of this is from No Name in the Street, and this is connected to where we're at now, Baltimore, Black Lives Matter. Um, he says, white children in the main, and whether they are rich or poor, grow up with a grasp of reality so feeble that they can very accurately be described as deluded about themselves and the world they live in. White people have managed to get through entire lifetimes in this euphoric state, but black people have not been so lucky. A black man who sees the world the way John Wayne, for example, sees, sees it would not be an ex... He, let me say that again. A black man who sees the world the way John Wayne, for example, sees it would not be an eccentric patriot, but a raving maniac. The reason for this at bottom is that the doctrine of white supremacy, which still controls most white people, is itself a stupendous delusion, but to be born black in America is an immediate, immortal challenge. People who cling to their delusions find it difficult, if not impossible, to learn anything worth learning. And I think that's really important, because I think, and, and this goes back to what Nikki was saying about simplicity and sincerity and yet the world is so complex. We live in a very, very complicated time, um, but we also live in a time filled with delusions, uh, delusions about racial equality, delusions that are connected to public policy, that are connected to institutions. I think, Karen, one of the best parts of the shortened film is when Jimmy's on the Dick Cavett show. And he's, he's, he's giving he a public, down. He's giving yeah. a public <laughs> policy, yeah. an historical um, um, uh, sermon, but also, uh, a seminar yeah, on yeah. the politics and practices of white supremacy, both personally, politically, and a policy way. So when we think about Baltimore, Nikki was mentioning McKinney, Texas, the number one problem that we're all facing, and we were at the Kennedy Library um, um, last year talking about civil rights and black power, black power. Is, the, is the delusion. Because even as we celebrate and commemorate the Civil Rights Acts, and we commemorate the Voting Rights Acts, right. and we commemorate all these acts, we have so many people in our country, right. including black women, including trans women, including poor children, who are not just dying, but are being systematically um, killed and oppressed by this very system that at the same time says, hey, let's pat ourselves on the back that we have a black president. Right. And let's celebrate so the saying, Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. So you're saying he would have, one of the things Maya Angelou says that he was, he was relentless in his insight. He would not have let us get away with not acknowledging that. Ayesha, Absolutely. you were going to jump in there. Uh, I just want to read a quote um, from the same book that you mentioned, James Baldwin, the last interview. He was being interviewed by Studs Terkel. And just to clarify, you know, growing up with him and being raised by the same woman who raised him, even though he did say, we're going to burn your houses down. If white America has not recognized that black people are not interested in harming you, then um, that's part of the delusion. It, it's part of the, the spin and the, the use of black images and equating it with violence that makes white people unable to move forward because there's this belief that has nothing to do with reality. Um, if it hasn't been proven time and time again that black people are not interested in harming or doing any harm, to the other members of the society, 
because of what's happened to them, we need to wake up and recognize that, you know, we can move beyond our fear and the guilt and this fear of the, you know, the boogeyman, the black person, the 14-year-old girl who's a threat, you know, at a pool party. You know, that's part of the homework assignment that my uncle left to white America and to this nation is that you need to be able to move beyond these emotions that keep you paralyzed and keep you from doing the social justice humanitarian work that needs to be done in order for this nation to become the nation that we propose it to be. Mm -hmm. um, in the interview, he says, I'm not mad at this country anymore. I'm very worried about it. I'm not worried about the Negroes in this country even, so much as I am about the country. The country doesn't know what it has done to Negroes, and the country has no notion whatever, and this is disastrous, of what it has done to itself. Mm. Right. So just to, just to wrap that up quickly and just to, to say that he left us all a homework assignment. And the assignment is not to focus on black pathology, but to look at whiteness and to do away with it. Because he said, as long as you think you're white, there's no hope for you because automatically it sets you apart from the rest of humanity. So how do we begin to have that conversation about doing away with the concept of whiteness as an identity that sets you apart from the rest of your, your human family? And that's the homework assignment that he left all of us and that's what the work we need to get back to doing. Mm. I like the idea of a, a homework assignment. That's yes. very powerful. I wonder how well, yes. Yeah. Um, um, his influence, in fact, on, on, on artists, Nikki brought this up, is, is one of the things I wanted to talk about. He had, had extraordinary influence as a teacher. Um, I um, had the honor of meeting Suzanne Laurie Parks, an incredible playwright who was directly uh, influenced by him. August Wilson, who says that his great 10 act, right, one of the singular accomplishments in American uh, theater history says that it came out of a call that James Baldwin made for a profound articulation of black life, which he defied as the rituals and mores which will sustain a man once he leaves his father's house. And from that, August Wilson created the piano lesson and two trains running. I mean, the, his influence is just astonishing. And, and so I don't know if you guys want to talk about that beyond, and, and Nikki, maybe you can jump in, and Rose, you can talk in, you're a poet, just also about his breadth of, of accomplishments. I mean, to write poetry, as well as plays, as well as fiction, as well as non-fictions. I mean, you know, those of us who write <laughs> know how uh, challenging it is to be accomplished in one area, let alone, what's that, six, eight? I don't know. Rose, you want to jump in? Well, I just saw a wonderful other side of Jimmy as um, almost a boy with my husband as a boy. They got to be friends, and when the two of them were invited to uh, the Nobel Prize dinner uh, at the White House. Jack Kennedy uh, invited both of them as the only two young writers. And they got together and said, oh, we're like Huck and Jim, you know, invited. <laughs> Here we are going uh -oh. down to Mississippi. <laughs> but they uh, shared so much, um, Bill being uh, the grandson of a slave owner and Jimmy being the grandson of a slave, they came at their friendship with each other very gradually and in a relaxed fashion because Jimmy was living on our property, but it was next door. And it was not really a guest house, it was Bill's studio, but he vacated it for Jimmy and they had lunch and dinner together and sat by the fire every evening and talked about the differences uh, in Southern and Northern and black and white. But they felt very close to each other and got closer and closer. And it was really Jimmy who encouraged uh, Bill to write uh, Nat Turner in the first person. And he almost dared Bill not to write it in the first person. 
And then after the confessions of Nat Turner came out, uh, despite a lot of praise and awards, it was much more memorable for 10 black writers respond because so many of uh, the black intellectuals and artists were very angry that Bill had tried to put himself inside uh, the black mind, the black character, and Jimmy then came out and defended him beautifully as having um, started our common history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very controversial chapter. I don't know if we want to get into that too much. It was very difficult. Um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah. I think Baldwin, um, to, to play off what Rose is saying, in the context of the 1960s, he's this incredibly important historical figure. And some of this has to do with his artistic influence, but also it's the fusion of art and politics. Right. So in a way, right. when you think about James Baldwin, uh, Lorraine Hansberry is somebody who we should talk about. Uh, yes. Because in a way, Lorraine Hansberry, and in my first book, I argued that Lorraine Hansberry and not Amiri Baraka is really the founder of the black arts movement because of um, a raisin, a raisin in, the in the Sun. Because a Raisin in the Sun anticipates the whole uh, epistemological foundation for what Bartz is going to do institutionally and artistically. So when you see Beneath the Younger, and I argued that Beneath the is the protagonist of that play, and it's not Walter mm -hmm. Lee. Beneath is the, Beneath the, black, the sister in is the, this play. Is the yes. black feminist, right. is the pan-Africanist, is the radical uh, uh, democratic activist. Um, so when we think about Baldwin, what's interesting is that Baldwin is friends and influences everybody from Lorraine Hansberry to Malcolm X to Martin Luther King Jr. to Stokely Carmichael to Angela Davis. That's singularly important. Certainly, he's connected, um, obviously, Bobby Kennedy in that meeting. Um, that is a, something we should probably talk about. Lorraine Hansberry's there, Baldwin's there, um, Harry One Belafonte's there. One of the interviews there. is from right after that yeah, meeting and where Kenneth, he... Kenneth Clark. Right, Kenneth Clark, yes. And, and that's Bobby Kennedy um, meeting in, in, in May of 1963 with these, these African-American writers. And there's a civil rights activist, young man from CORE, who's there too, to try to find the pulse of the nation. Jerome. Um, Jerome, yeah, yes. Jerome Smith. And, and so when we think about Baldwin, Baldwin was connecting literary and political and artistic all together. And it, it, right. one, yeah. one final word, Baldwin was not a public intellectual. What he was, and he called himself this, was a public witness. Mm. He's this gargantuan mm -hmm. intellectual and this genius, but he's a public witness well, because it's never about Baldwin, it's really about the movement and radical humanism. Right, well, it, what he also, what he also yeah. and, and Karen, you can jump in here, what he also called himself was an artist, and he believed that artists had a responsibility. I mean, profoundly, there's a great essay called The Artist's Struggle for Integrity that he wrote. Where he, go ahead. He talked about the poet, um, and he said, it's not the preacher, and it's not the politician, and it's not, and he named several um, different folks, and he said, it's really the poet who leads us into the arena. Mm -hmm. And by poet, he did mean artist. Right. And there's so many things to take from so many of his words, not to take them and weigh them against each other, but to use them in, uh, in the same circle, and in this moment, again, in this country at this time, when so many arts organizations are losing funding and not um, being at the forefront of our communities and societies as, you know, as they should, um, we should bring Baldwin into that conversation because it's, it's, it's time that we really understand that part of the reason I believe we are returning to so many of the things that we thought we were not, would not return to, but we're right back in the thick of it, is because we have really lost sight of the power of the arts to teach us who we are, not just individually, but who we are side by side in right. this room. Right. Mm -hmm. And not just art as entertainment, right. forbid, but art as, <laughs> as, as, as opening up our chests and letting us see each other for really who we are so that we can find our way to the humanity that Baldwin always talks about. And I just want to say one last thing about um, Baldwin. Uh, Edward, Edward P. Jones wrote the new mm. introduction um, to Baldwin's uh, Notes of a Native Son. Notes of a Native Son, thank you. And I, I, love, I love what he says in this. And I, I want to say something about Beacon Press, too, because I wouldn't be on the stage and involved in the process. 
and um, if not for Beacon Press and, and for the, the passion that they have for, for keeping Baldwin close and, and in the world. But Edward P. Jones uh, says that he has this beautiful, beautiful narrative at the end. And the last thing he says, he did all of this and all of this and all of this, and he never shouted. Yes. That's right. the last three words of the whole essay. And if you think about it, he always gets accused of being bitter and mad and crazy and all of these things. That's not Baldwin you're talking about. That's your image of a black man in America. Right. And that's the same thing that happens right now, tonight, tomorrow, and going forward. Right. And not until we address what is in our you know, what is ticker taping through our minds about what blackness is and who is black and what blackness means, will we ever stop looking at young black men as criminals or threats or violent or all of those things? That's what Baldwin was talking about 50, 60 years ago. He's still talking about it. The lessons are still there. The books are still there. His words are still there and we don't use it. Right. I, that's right. Aisha, I'm going to let you get in. I just want to read that quote that you, you were talking about, Nikki, because you're right. How, however arrogant this may sound, I want to suggest two propositions. The first one is that the poets, by which I mean all artists, are finally the only people who know the truth about us. Soldiers don't. Statesmen don't. Priests don't. Union leaders don't. Only poets. So you know I want to be a poet. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Makes me want to be a poet, and I can't write poetry to Everybody save my life. I want to be a poet after that. Go ahead. I just wanted to jump in real quick and say that one of the things that he did for for me and for a particular generation, and um, you know, in terms of the whole argument that's been happening about, you know, um, he said that the artist's job is to disturb the peace. He never separated yeah. art from activism, right. art from social justice. Um, he partied, he had a fabulous time, he, he, he loved to drink, he, he loved the finer things in life. One of his favorite places was the Russian Tea Room. Um, he would often hang out with his you know, celebrity friends, but after that he went to work for social justice and, and, and for civil rights. And so there's this whole question about what does it mean to be an artist? And mm -hmm. he defined it for me as constantly disturbing that place that we settle into where we get comfortable with ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we've read Baldwin and we've read this and, and, uh, and he, he never stopped. And he gave, he was a true maverick in, 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 in the, the truest sense of the word. He gave a blueprint to people of how you can live your life outside of the projections of the greater society. So all those, the society says this is what a black man is. This is what a gay person is. This is what someone who was born poor in the inner city is. He smashed all of that. And he turned the lens onto the people who were judging him and said, no, I, there's nothing wrong with, you, with me. I'm not a nigger, I'm a man. And when he said that, he changed the conversation and began to, and, and allowed people to accept who they were fully, no matter where they came from and no matter what color they were. So he made being an artist this incredible thing that you know, is very hard to, to put in a box. Right. He just right. smashed it all and said, do you write, sing, dance? Right. You know, become fully who you are, and I think you know that was one of his greatest gifts I agree. to us. Yeah, okay. so Karen, and well, then I, Penelope. I just wanted—I couldn't agree more. But I would say that importantly, he was a disturber of our peace, but he was also a disturber of his own peace. Right. That yeah. he went out and tried to do mm -hmm. stuff that shook up his own yes. comfort zone. Exactly. And one of the th things that I think about is the book that uh, he was writing right before he, he died, he intended to die. We were going to, I think, we were going to make a film about the book that he was going to write, which was to be called Remember This House. Right. And he was going to go through the, the South and revisit the places where he had spent mm -hmm. the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. He was going to write about um, his, his friends, Malcolm X, Medgar Evers, Martin Luther King, but intercut with that memoir, he was going to have three, interviews be the centerpiece of the book. And 
they were with the son of Medgar Evers, the son of Martin Luther King, the daughter of um, Malcolm X, and he was going to ask them, and we were going to be there filming when this, these interviews took place, and he was going to ask them a question to start the interview, which he had not prepared them for, and that question was, was it worth it that mm. your father was assassinated? Mm. Wow. And we never got to film that. He never did those interviews. Mm. I, I do believe that the filmmaker Raoul Peck is trying yeah. to do yeah. a, a filmic version of, of that book that was never written. But that, for me, is something Baldwin, once again, it was his last effort. He didn't get to complete it, but he was disturbing a lot of things by asking those questions and trying to construct an artistic work in that with and, that formula. And, and, refu and I'm going to let you jump in. And refusing, by the way, it just so happens, I know that the daughter of Malcolm X is in town tonight speaking at the um, African Meeting House, mm -hmm. Ilyasa mm -hmm. Shabazz. So talk about kismet, I don't know. Um, 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 I worked on her autobiography with her. Um, but um, uh, his, his refusal to, to ignore, I mean, what he, the last thing he says there is, is that he believes, but that there's a cost. He was always so... Uh, clear about the, that there's a cost, and there was a cost. So this interest that he he was asking about the cost to these children, which is a real thing. We don't we like to gloss over that, right? There was a real cost that these families had to pay, and of course there was a real cost that he had to pay for being James Baldwin too. I think so. Um, it's really profound that you should bring that up. Well, it's also so much so re we want to go to Benil, but so related to progress. I mean, he he's asking them that question because he recognized, yes. There are things to commemorate, as you said, but there's so many things that uh, we call it post-racial. Yeah. I want to, building on this, I think we should talk about why the silence is about Baldwin, because I think 28 okay. years yeah, I after get to his that. death, because okay. um, I've, I've written about Stokely Carmichael, I've written about people, or Kwame Touré, and Kwame Touré's in that, you know, the, the funeral scene, um, but why the silence is, because I think there's, even what um, Aisha was talking about and what Nikki's been talking about and Rose, Part of what's happening to us in 2015 is that there were, we want to celebrate the victories but not discuss the defeats, right? We want to celebrate the people who are emblematic and reflective of the victories but not talk about the shortcomings and the failures and the underside of civil rights, the underside of the environmental movement, the underside of the women's movement where, you know, it takes Roland Martin to, to humiliate the National Organization of Women to say something about the young black girl in McKinney, Texas. Mm -hmm. It takes that to happen. So part of it is that when you think about Baldwin, there's a reason why Baldwin is silenced. There's a reason why we don't study Baldwin. And now, you know, Karen and Doug have done a great job of just bringing this back in. And we, we should, I've, I've taught this film, and we should be, all of us who are educators should make sure that, that you know, Baldwin is on, on the lips of our students. Yes. But there's a reason why, because even what we're talking about, Baldwin making us all sort of giving us this new expansive universal identity to jump out the box, right? Mm -hmm. Citizenship in the United States in 2015 is purchased citizenship, right? So on one per, one, from one perspective, you can be gay, black, trans, and we've seen it, um, um, and, and be on the cover of Vanity Fair from a specific perspective. But from another that's talking about poor people, that's talking about people who are in, in prison that's talking about, um, we have a, a, a young black man who just uh, committed suicide, who had been in Rikers Island uh, oh. for three years when he was 16 years old, mentally ill. For stealing for, a backpack. For stealing a backpack, allegedly, right? So what, allegedly. what kind of world do we live in? And Baldwin actually takes us to the core of that. And so there's a reason why the silencing is occurring, and we should talk about that. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about it. Who wants to talk about it? Why is the Absolutely. silencing occurring? Well, I feel that part of carrying on his legacy, and I had this discussion with Nikki earlier, and part of my job and my mission is to get him, if not into the classrooms, into the hands of young people beginning as early as the age 12. Because I feel like freshman English I started, 101. I started reading them to my kids when they were six. So okay, say, wonderful. Like, they're like, oh, are we listening to right. Baldwin again? Okay, yeah. Right, <laughs> yes, right. We are. And um, because there's a particular uh, age where a, a person's consciousness is being formed, um, where impressions about the world and about life and who people are and what is important. And if, if you don't, you know, there's something about indigenous cultures when they take young men and young women into rites of passage at 12, 
when someone has a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah at 12. There's an understanding in traditional cultures that this is a crucial point in the development of young people's consciousness and we're ushering them into the next stage. I feel like his writings are crucial and very important for young people to be introduced to at an earlier age. So part of my goal and my mission is to get his, his books. And if, and if I have to do it through grassroots organizations, if the schools won't accept it, if I have to give them to people to, to, to read to their children just to get Baldwin being read again, um, it, it, it's, it's important because having that kind of voice introduced to me at a young age and that, pers pers that, that, that person who he was made such an impact on me. No one could tell me that I was inferior to anyone. No one could say to me that as a black woman that there was something wrong with me because I was given the tools at a very early age to be able to analyze whiteness for the illusion that it is. And so I can carry myself and sit amongst people and feel completely empowered and comfortable because I never bought into the illusion. And so we have to get to our kids young before they believe the lie that they are less than or inferior. Do you think that? Thank you. Do we, um, Nikki, I don't know if you want to jump in here, and do we, do we think this is happening? I mean, um, last, this year, right, it's the 90th, and the 90th anniversary of his birth, is that right, Ayesha, yes. last yes. year, right? Yes. And uh, New well, York, I know. last year, zero, this year he, he turned one, one, so it's his right. 90th birthday, right. August 2nd. Exactly. Right, and of <laughs> right. course, I know New York City did an extraordinary yes. uh, series of conversations, and, and so. Street naming. Uh, street naming and, and all this stuff, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I don't know what other people are thinking. I, I teach him every semester, um, and it is true that very few of my students who come in have, have read him. It's, it's, it's amazing. And many, some of them have never even heard of him, which breaks yes. my heart. Um, but m even those who have heard of him have not read him. So I'm what, wondering. What is wonderful when you do get the people who they, haven't. They eat it up. They it's, eat it's it up. Like, and it's like this, water. Like first manna. of all, this it's, guy sounds like today. He really right. was from that century. He's not now. And he's right. talking about now. And he's speaking right. to me. And. It's, it's extraordinary to see what can happen if you just get it in front they, of them. They do. They, they yeah, sometimes when I teach about James Baldwin, I begin, because I'm from South Carolina, and I begin with the black codes in South Carolina, I begin with my knowledge of the fact that enslaved black people in South Carolina, if they were ever caught with a book or a writing instrument or anything of that sort, hands were cut off, feet were cut off, lives were taken. And I leave, I, I bring the code out, we, we read it, I let it sift through the air, and then I put on James Baldwin video. And I arc from 1832 to James Baldwin. And somebody will inevitably, a smart, hungry mind like mm -hmm. you're talking about, will mm -hmm. say, oh, I know why they killed him. Oh, I know why the hand was taken or the foot was taken, because what he's doing is the most powerful thing you can do as a human being living in a society. Mm -hmm. What he's talking about, reading, learning, knowing who you are. If you're an enslaved person and somebody says, by, all, by any means necessary, you will not know what freedom is, Baldwin is doing the same thing. He's doing it many years later, but he's doing exactly the same thing. He's empowering all of us here to be better than we are. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Republic does not want you to do that. <laughs> the Republic wants you to fall in line. Mm -hmm. The Republic, which was Baldwin's term, and which mm -hmm. I use all the time in homage to him, is wanting you to think simply you know, it, yeah. about this very complicated world we live in. Right. And when we teach Baldwin, we give our, our, our students and we give ourselves the tools to think about each other in more complicated ways than we do in, in daily life, than, than CNN or Fox or anybody else will teach you. And that goes against the rules of the Republic. And so that's why we don't talk about Baldwin. And that's why we should run out of here with as much Baldwin in us <laughs> that we can hold. Yes. 
We get one life, y'all. That's right. As far as I know, this is the one life, right? <laughs> we should not let a young person grow up in America and not know James Baldwin. <laughs> Period. I agree. Here, he, he, what you're speaking of, I just thought of another quote where in uh, as much truth as one can bear, his essay, he says, we live in a country in which words are mostly used to cover the sleeper, not to wake him up. Anything you think about, James Baldwin already got there and right, did it better exactly. than you, all right? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, but may, Rose, your um, book, the book is coming out and maybe this might be a way to introduce James Baldwin uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that, about uh, the chapter in there? About, um... There's a chapter about, uh, yeah, about their friendship and about how, uh, well, it reminisces about times when we were all together in Paris or New York or the whole literary group with, you know, James Jones and how both Bill and uh, Jimmy resented Norman Mailer's attitude towards things. So it, yes, that's there are a lot essay. of different things in this, but mainly uh, in this book and in uh, his uh, the selected letters of William Starman, which I edited, uh, we couldn't get uh, Jimmy's uh, Bill's letters to Jimmy, but Bill's Bill talks about Jimmy and the influence that he was, and the moral compass that he was for Bill. And Jimmy, when he lived in Connecticut, really had a tremendous influence on uh, the other writers. It was a big artist's community of uh, actors and playwrights and uh, musicians and dancers, and they all, um, came to our house because Jimmy was a magnet and they wanted to know what he really believed was happening in the United States and what the possibilities were, both good and bad. And I think he educated a whole group of artists of our generation uh, about uh, the problems in America, the race problems, uh, but uh, also the responsibility that artists have right. to try to make things better in the world as they see them. And certainly the 60s, uh, which was when we knew Jimmy, or the height of the problems in race relations, uh, when things changed and we all knew how significant he was right. and looked to him for guidance in that. Profound, yes. I would like yes. To say yeah. Building on that, it, one, one thing Rose said the 60s were the height of the race relations problem. This is a new height in 2015, in some levels, Rose, in terms of race relations. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think love is important here to talk about Baldwin and love. And Baldwin loved um, humanity, but Baldwin has a deep love for black people. And I think that's a revolutionary act yes. in this world. Um, he has a deep, and in that, he really converges with people like Ella Baker. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame, Kwame Touré, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's got a deep, profound love for black people. He talks about this autobi autobiographically in his essays. He loves poor black people. He first encountered them in Harlem. And again, that's very, very important because this is a society where even black people have hatred for black people, especially poor black people, especially black people who don't have access. So for the people like, ba what Baldwin does is provide a model I mean, he provides a model of selfless, courageous leadership, but deep, empathetic humanity and love. Because sometimes, even people who are advocating on behalf of black people and mass incarceration and these things, they don't love black people. They might not love people at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so the deep love for people here is very, very important. Because you cannot be a political activist. You can't be a revolutionary if you don't have a deep love for people. And the hardest people to love in this country, in this world, are black people by virtue, by virtue of what Jimmy talked about vis-a-vis -vis Western civilization. Not because of black people, what they've done, but because of what Western civilization has done to this whole idea and concept of blackness. And we are all, all implicated. 
because we all live in this country and in this world. So you might think to yourself, well, I've read all these books, so I got no problem with black people. No, you're part of the problem, too. You're part of the problem, too, because we're all implicated. You can't, yeah. you can't escape in this society having deep, deep problems um, about black people. When black people are being shot and the way we're portrayed in popular culture, I did a talk in Miami and there was an 18-year-old black girl who asked me, why are we treated this way? She's 18 years old, Miami-Dade Community College. She was on the verge of tears mm -hmm. saying, why does pop culture treat us this way, right? And she wasn't just talking about the news, she was talking about shows like Empire on Fox. Right. She was talking about all these different things. Why, why are black women and men treated this way? But Jimmy Baldwin looked through Explains all that it, yeah. and just had this important love, and we should talk and about that. I think we were here to talk about Ferguson and Baltimore. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Well, it's absolutely. our job yeah. now. That is our job. It's our job it now to so read him. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, to wrap up, I think we're going we're gonna to wrap up, I think um, to end on uh, James Baldwin's profound love is a good place to yeah. end. Um, and I unfortunately couldn't find the quote. I only got about half my books here. Some of them were in my office, sorry. <laughs> but, um, um, but where he talks about love, and it's some, some quote about, and I, I did want to talk about just, that I did find one quote um, where you were talking about um, his profound love for black people um, and for black life. And this is from the, uh, Down at the Cross, um, which is, the, or no, this is from um, My Dungeon Shook. Um, and um, actually, no, this one's down at the cross, where, of course, his, his great essay about his going into the church and then leaving the church and then about the nation of Islam, I mean, it's just, it's a masterpiece. But he, it, what, one of the things I loved about James, James Baldwin is his, even when he is critical of something, it's always undergirded with love. So even though he left the Christian church and he was very critical of it, he, it's still undergirded with love. And he said, but I cannot, he, he spends talking about all his problems with the church that he left. And he says, but I cannot leave it at that. There's more to it than that. He never leaves it at that. He always, there's always more to it. He will not let you simplify, right? In spite of everything, there was in the life I fled a zest and a joy and a capacity for facing and surviving disaster that are very moving and very rare. Perhaps we were, all of us, pimps, whores, racketeers, church members, and children, bound together by the nature of our oppression, the specific and peculiar complex of risk we had to run. If so, within these limits, we sometime achieved with each other a freedom that was close to love. And there's another quote somewhere where he talks about love does not begin and end the way we think it does. Love is a struggle. Love is a, maybe you can quote it better than I can, Nikki. Love is, is, is a battle. Love is a growing up. Yeah. We have to yeah. grow up yeah. in this country. Yeah. And James Baldwin mm -hmm. showed us the way. He was yeah. the most grown up person yeah. I've never had the honor to yeah. meet. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we can final words. That's, yeah. That's good. That does, that did, that's good. Thank you all for coming.